in a house where like my dad lived with us, but my dad wasn't really there. So essentially my mum was a single parent. So even though I had those issues in my early primary school years with the language and stuff, I actually think I would probably worked overtime to assimilate. So once I'd learned the language and once my accent had gone, those experiences that I had in my early years, they did disappear. And then I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So that was on Christmas Eve. 2020. I had the trifactor of treatment, chemo, surgery, radiotherapy, I had all of it man. It was exhausting but through it all I can honestly say that I was excited because I knew that God was going to get me through it and I also knew there was a huge blessing coming after it. My passion is helping people to do well and to do better and to you know achieve their dreams etc and really just helping people to progress and i remember my line manager at the time was amazing he was the most controversial manager ever in the sense that every one to one there were f words going left right and center but he was also the sweetest man in the world and one of the things that he said to me in one of my one-to-ones was grace you're not a counselor and you're not these people's friends. Stop caring about where they go and concentrate on getting them into work and getting your bonus. Welcome to another episode of Everyday Leadership. And today I have the organization include inclusionists. I have someone who is an amazing person that I met a couple of months ago. I was just the first thing to be there, actually. We got talking when we arrived. I was like, you know what? There's something about it. There's something about her that I'm curious to learn more about. And the more and more that we have talked ever since, we've learned more and more about her journey. I find Grace Masuro absolutely inspiring. And I thought, you know what? I'm keeping her to myself. Let me, let me share her with you. Let me share her story with you. I mean, bring you on the podcast and have a have a conversation. Grace, thank you very much for coming on Everyday Leadership. Thank you so much for having me, sir. I um, yeah, I absolutely love that we got the time to meet early, like before everybody else joined. It was so good, obviously, to meet you. I've learned so much from you so far, um, and I steal a lot of your techniques for my podcast, as you know. So I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure and you are someone who you run your own business now you've run a previous business before you've worked in corporate spaces for a very long time as well in some amazing blue chip companies who is grace so grace is firstly the organizational inclusionist um so i support organizations to in to create inclusive spaces where everyone that works there can reach for the stars surpassing the skies. Like one of the things that I'm really, really passionate about is removing some of the current barriers that exist for people from minority backgrounds um, and helping organizations to really make a way for those people to progress um, in an equitable way. I am also a mother. Um, so I have a beautiful 12 year, year old daughter who is my absolute world um, and definitely keeps me on my toes. Um, I'm also a podcast host, so I have a podcast called The Organisational Inclusionist, which is about everything equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, and you have kindly joined me for an episode that will be out soon. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I um, am also someone who has experienced a number of different challenges over the course of my 39 years. And those challenges have really fed into kind of my lived experience and my understanding of some of the challenges that people face in the world of work and in wider society, which has essentially driven me to understand what my purpose is and to walk in that with what I do for a living. Love that. And so is how the things that we go through can shape us in a good way and a bad way. Mm. And you're someone who has very much utilized your experiences to drive you forward, um, which we're definitely going to get, in, get into for sure. But before I do that, let's let's go back to younger you, younger Grace, six, seven-year-old Grace. What were you like, baby? Six, seven-year-old Grace had just moved to the UK. So I moved to the UK when I was five years old and I could not understand the language or speak it. 
so six or seven year old Grace had finally learnt the English language, had been taken out of the remedial class that she was put in when she arrived in the UK because she couldn't speak the language and was now socialising with other kids. So I was uh, in general population, as I call it. Um, I could speak English um, and I had a very thick Nigerian accent, which at that time in Clapham meant that I was teased. I was called all sorts of names. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was Grace at six or seven. I was a big sister as well, so I, or I still am a big sister. So at that time, I was very, very protective of my little sister. Like she was my best friend. Um, and if I couldn't protect myself against some of like the snide comments and, and the horrible things that were said, I was definitely going to protect my sister. So I was regularly in various arguments, um, just, yeah, protecting my, I was going to call her my daughter, but she's like, she's my bestie. She was my first, first best friend. So yeah, that was six or seven year old Grace. Wow. What, is, what were those two years like between five to seven year old you learning the language and still having to be at school and dealing with the bullying which I'm sure didn't just come from the kids that have been in their mm. environment it would have been quite tough do you remember much around how it was for you yeah it was interesting because like moving to a new country is a stark change anyway but at that age doing it and moving from a country where you aren't a minority. So when I grew up, or well, growing up in Nigeria until I was five, you know, everyone in Nigeria looked like me. I didn't experience racism. I didn't feel different because I wasn't different. You know, we were all the same. But moving to the UK and not understanding, lang understanding the language, not being able to speak it, um, and also moving to a whole different education system as well. So it was, it was very, very shocking, I think. And I think the the thing is to understand as well, people always assume that because you're from Africa, um, maybe you're a little bit behind, you know, because the view is that the West is so far ahead everywhere else. But education wise, the education in Nigeria is actually further progressed than the education in the UK. Yes. So once I had learned the language, they actually saw that actually me and my sister were smarter than the kids that we were learning with because we'd been taught a couple of years ahead in Nigeria based on the types, probably a few years ahead, based on the types of problems that we were dealing with and, and learning in school. So I think there were so many stark differences that it was just really, really strange. And I just remember, you know, going home and talking to my mum about some of these things. And my mum came to the UK with me and my sister. My dad didn't join us until a few years later. So my mum was working like crazy like working three jobs looking after these two kids we lived with a nanny at the time as well so that my mum could work to find us a place and to afford a place so it was like we'd come home to our nanny but not necessarily be able to communicate what was happening in school because she was a nanny and she had a few other kids and she was busy she didn't care and we saw my mum every weekend and on the weekends the weekends were so precious that we would talk about a little bit of it. But when we could see that it was upsetting my mum, we wouldn't talk very much about it. So it was very, I think I learned from a very young age to protect other people's feelings, but also to handle things by myself. Um, and, you know, I I think it's probably created a little bit of molly cuddling in me as a mum now with my daughter, because I try and get her to tell me everything so I can take the pain away. But growing up as a child, you know, I was all about protecting my mom, protecting my sister and dealing with those issues by myself. And a lot of the time, you know, dealing with it might have meant if it was directed to me, just ignoring it because I didn't want to do anything that would get me in trouble and mean that my mom is called and my mom's stressed out, etc. But it was challenging, man. It wasn't easy at all. But I lived with my best friend. Like, I lived with my sister at the nannies. So for me, going home was like the best place to be because I got to play with my best friend all day. Um, and that is more what I remember than some of that trauma and the headaches of name calling and whatever. Now you're speaking the language, you're growing up, you're in secondary school now. 
were you still in Clapham at that point in time or had you moved by then? Yeah, no, we were still in Clapham, living my best life in Clapham Common. <laughs> I love Clapham. What was secondary school like? Pardon? What was secondary school like? Secondary school was amazing. So even though I had those issues in my early, like primary school years with the language and stuff, once I had... I actually think I would probably worked overtime to assimilate. So once I'd learned the language and once my accent had gone, um, you know, the those experiences that I had in my early years, they did disappear because in Clapham, Clapham at the time was majority black. I went to a primary school where most of the people that went to school with me were black. Um, so, you know, other than African bubu, I didn't really hear anything else in terms of like, derogatory statements and the African bubble comments came from people that looked like me but they just weren't African right um so by the time I got to secondary school I was confident in who I was you know I'd caught up with everybody in terms of the language in terms of the culture and you know just the slang and stuff like that so secondary school was amazing for me I went to an absolutely fantastic school um called the Greycoats Hospital, shout out, in Victoria. And that in that school, I was a minority. So I think at the time there were maybe, in my form, so in my form, my class, there were maybe four black girls out of 30. And that was pretty much across the board, right? <clears throat> but I never felt different. I was never treated differently. My teachers, like supported me they encouraged me they saw what I was good at and they developed that and they encouraged it like I absolutely had a phenomenal time at that school which is why my daughter goes there now um but yeah like I had I had teachers advocating for me left right and center um I had the usual girl stuff because Grey Coats is a girl's school um the usual girl stuff but I had an amazing secondary education like it was phenomenal and at that point in time, did you have an idea of what you wanted to be or what you wanted to do? Yeah. <laughs> so I was going to be a lawyer. And the reason I was going to be a lawyer was because I was very good at arguing. So I did not enter an argument that I knew I wouldn't win. And if I entered the argument, you were not going to win that argument because I came to that argument with facts. I came to that argument with evidence. And I came to that argument with reason. And I remember, I think it was one day when I was debating with my mom and she was like, you better be a lawyer. And as you probably know, coming from a Nigerian household, the expectation is that you either become an accountant, a doctor or a lawyer. And my mom basically said, out of the three, you're going to be a lawyer because you argue a lot. Um, and I was really excited about it. I was like, yeah, I definitely want to be a lawyer. And I, I wanted to be a lawyer all up until... I absolutely flopped my A-levels and didn't get the grades that I needed to do law at university. And then I decided to do a different degree and I was meant to do a law conversion course once I finished that degree. But I decided I was gonna do a degree that was a four year degree that included a gap year where you went and got a job. Hmm. And I got a taste of money <laughs> earning. <laughs> And they said, there is absolutely no way that I'm going to do another year to get a law conversion course and then another God knows how many years to train to be a lawyer. Let me just get into the job market now and chop some cash because I like this. <laughs> so I didn't become a lawyer, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. um, and that is why. <laughs> when you decided not to pursue that, what was the reaction at home? Um... If I'm honest, I think by that point, my mom was just, um, so I grew up in a house where like my dad lived with us, but my dad wasn't really there. So essentially my mom was a single parent. My dad wasn't at home very much. And my mom had three kids by this point and she had just so much going on. She was working really hard. She was exhausted. Um, by the time I, yeah, but I think by the time I was going to uni as well, like my mom's health wasn't 100%. So for her, it was just about, I want you to be secure. So as long as you can tell me that you have a plan, then that's fine. So by that point, she was cool. So now you're, you're in it, you're in your career, you're chopping your money. 
was that as a um in recruitment was that what you were doing yeah. at that point in time yeah so i when i finished my degree i went straight into a grad scheme um at an amazing recruitment company it was the best 18 months of my life but it flashed before my eyes like literally i can't remember half of what i did in that in that time because i was working 12 hour days like literally working so hard to hit my targets to get my bonus etc that i had no social life i don't even know how i sustained a relationship because i was working so hard and growing up in my house especially as the firstborn um the expectation was that i was going to be successful that i was going to set an example i was going to provide for my siblings and make a way for them so working hard was instilled with me from instilled in me from very very early on and that's exactly what i took to any job that i did even my weekend jobs before i moved into professional work um so yeah i worked my bum off um absolutely loved it did really well there but there came a point even at the age of i think it was, I was 22 by then when I was like, this isn't the life that I want. I don't want to be working 12 hour days and not seeing my friends or not spending time with my loved ones. Um, there must be something more that I can do that gives me a sense of purpose and also gives me money. Um, and I remember my line manager at the time was amazing. <clears throat> like I still shout him, I shout him out often on LinkedIn. He was the most he was the most controversial manager ever in the sense that every one to one there were f words going left right and center but he was also the sweetest man in the world and one of the things that he said to me in one of my one to ones was Grace you're not a counselor and you're not these people's friends stop caring about where they go and concentrate on getting them into work and getting your bonus and i was like I don't like that. <laughs> I want to make sure they're happy. And he was like, they know where they're going to work. Why are you spending so much time with them? Like they know what they're doing. They know what they're looking for. And I was like, I know, but I want to make sure they're okay. Um, so he actually helped me to understand kind of what drives me a little bit more. And, and it really was about supporting people to be the best that they can be and to achieve what they want to achieve. Um, and that essentially is what kind of started me off on the path that I went on to. If you ever think about recruitment, you're 22 years old, you're working all the hours, it sounds like 12 hour days, which is intense. Yeah. But you're also earning good money at that point in time, the bonuses are rolling in. It is very easy to be like, you know what, I'm just gonna focus on the money and then in a couple of years, I'll focus on the friends and, and everything else. Mm. Why was it that for you, it was a very, very short period of time that that lasted and it, wouldn't, it didn't satisfy you long enough? Do you know? I honestly don't know because I agree. So many people do just get on with it and they're like, you know, I'll make, I'll make time later. Um, I don't know if it's because of the way that I was raised, but my goal was always to you know, to eventually be married and to have kids and to look after a family and to look after the people around me. So the idea of not having any time to do that just didn't sit well with me. Like it just didn't, I wasn't, my mum was like the love of my life at the time as well, even though I had a boyfriend, like my mum was the love of my life and I wasn't even seeing my mum and I lived with her. Like I'd leave before she was up I'd get home after she'd gone to bed sometimes or I'd get home and we'd only get an hour to catch up. And that hour was like not very good quality because I was exhausted, you know, and she was also ushering me into bed because she could see how exhausted I was. So I just I was missing my people, you know, I was missing my people. And I human human connection is really important to me. A lot of the work that I did in recruitment was over the phone. So there wasn't really that human connection and you're working in a really salesy environment where it is almost like kill or be killed, like dog eat dog, you know? And that that wasn't what I was used to. Like I I wanted, you know, relationships with people and I just didn't, I didn't really have that. I had a great like grad team that we joined together and we were really good friends, but we only really saw each other at lunchtime because we were all heads down. 
you know? <laughs> so it was like, why am I doing this? So how did you eventually actually make that pivot from doing what you're doing in recruitment to moving into like that employee relationship kind of role you, that you end up moving into the start now that career path? So I made a decision um, at some point during my time there in which I just couldn't, I didn't want to do it anymore. And so I, and it was mad as well because it was the month that I had, exceeded my targets the most and I'd like my my line manager was buzzing he was so proud and I remember typing my resignation letter up and asking to see him and we sat down in the meeting room and he said Grace what's wrong and I said <laughs> I can still remember it now he said I burst into tears because I loved him he was like the best manager ever I was like I'm really sorry Liam I'm leaving <laughs> He was like, no. And then he starts crying as well. And if you ever saw this man, like you would never think that crying was something he did. And we're literally both there crying. And I was like, you know, I don't, this doesn't serve me. It's not, it's not what I want to do. You know that you're always telling me not to counsel people. Um, and I think I need to go and find what, you know, what really makes me smile and what really makes me happy. And he was like, I completely after we finished crying, he was like, I, I understand, I'm gutted to lose you, but I do understand. Uh, he gave me the most amazing reference. But essentially, after I left, I was approached by um, a recruiter who said, you know, we can see you've got recruitment experience. And I said, yeah. And they said, oh, you know, why did you leave recruitment? And I explained, because my passion is helping people to do well and to do better and to you know achieve their dreams etc and really just helping people to progress and he said okay well I've got this job for you which is essentially doing what you were doing but it's supporting disadvantaged people into work that's what they called okay. it at the time so it's basically supporting unemployed people to find work anyone that was on JSA or any other type of unemployment benefit I would be their recruitment consultant essentially and I was like boom this is it this is this is what will serve my spirit. And I did that for a couple of years and then moved into managing teams that did what I was doing. And and I absolutely loved it. You know, there was the fulfillment, there was the social value. Um, I was literally seeing the impact that my interventions or the interventions of my teams were having on individuals' lives. And as you can imagine, you know, at that time, I was supporting predominantly people from ethnic minorities into work because at that time, they were the ones that were traditionally right. needing that support. So it was just so empowering and, and it really fulfilled me at the time. Um, and I loved developing my team as well and coaching my team to progress. Um, and yeah, so I did that for a few years and then moved into stakeholder engagement for a company uh, looking to do what I was doing previously to support disadvantaged people into work and they were bidding for contracts to do that. So I basically led on their stakeholder engagement to enable them to secure a government contract to do that. Um, and then after a while, what I found in that role, I was only in that role for a year, but I found in that role that I was missing the team. So I didn't have a team, it was just me. I didn't manage anyone. I wasn't supporting or coaching anyone. And I missed that element of things. I missed supporting people and, you know, kind of paying it forward. So I moved into a leadership coaching role with um, a startup, actually, which was scary as hell, but um, was amazing. And my mentor today is the ex-CEO of that startup company. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and it was an amazing five years with them. Um, I Did they find them when they found you? Um, my previous mentor at the time actually found the opportunity um, while I was in my stakeholder engagement role because I used to meet up with him once a month and I'd talk to him about kind of, I feel like something's missing. Um, so he was always looking out for opportunities for me and he found that opportunity and said, I think you should apply for this. And I got that. I did that for a few years and I was coaching leaders from all sorts of organizations. So coaching them to really navigate the day to day of leading diverse teams and like, 
you know, navigating organizational politics and values and making sure that their values were aligned with the way they were leading, etc. Um, did that for a few years and then moved into partnerships. Um, so I moved into a partnership director role for the same organization. Um, and then I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, so that was on Christmas Eve 2020. Um, yeah, so it was rubbish. <laughs> it was, and it was rubbish just because of the day that they gave me the news. Like, but also I'm a, I'm a believer, you know, I believe in God. And, um, at the time, essentially, so basically I found a lump in my right breast during the first lockdown. And you if you remember the first lockdown, everything closed down the doctor's surgeries, everything. So I I kind of ignored it and thought, oh no, this is just, um, it's just going to be a cyst because my mum and my sister had both had them before and I was like, oh, it's just my turn, it's minor. Um, so I ignored it. And then we get to the second lockdown and I one day was working at my desk and I felt it again. And I was like, I think the GPs are open now. So just and I had a daughter at the time as well so I was like I need to be let me be responsible and just go and get this checked out just to get it ticked off and I called the GP and told them what I'd found and I've never gotten a GP appointment so quickly they saw me that afternoon and I was like oh that was quick <laughs> so I went in listen they don't mess about when it comes to anything that could be cancer so, and I remember going and I told them the same thing. I said, I think it's a breast mouse. My mum and my sister have had it, this, that, and the other. And they examined me and said, yeah, we think it's the same thing, but we do need to refer you for a biopsy, et cetera, just to be on the safe side. We do it with everyone. So cool. Went in for my biopsy a couple of weeks later, um, had a biopsy. And I was really blessed with the consultant that I saw because she gave me a biopsy and she said, before we do the biopsy, we're going to do an ultrasound on the right breast, which is where I found the lump. And they did that. And then she said, but you know what, to be on the safe side, I want to do one on your left one as well. And she did that. And then they biopsied my right breast while they were looking at the ultrasound results because they knew there was a lump in the right breast. They, they could feel it. And then while I was having that biopsy, after it, they said, oh, come and see us. I went and sat down with the consultant and she showed me the images and she said, we've seen calcification in your left breast, which means that there's a chance that there is something going on there that could be cancer. So we need to biopsy that one as well. By now, I was ready to cry because biopsies are so painful. Any woman that's ever had a biopsy, I'm so sorry, sis. Like that is not pleasant. They literally, it's like a gun that goes into your body <laughs> and catches some skin and then yanks it out. Like it's sudden, it's traumatic, it's horrible. And they had to do a few on both breasts. It was horrible. Anyway, they said, you know, we'll send you a letter with the date for you to come in for your results. I got my letter, it said Christmas Eve. And I said, my God and King is not going to give me bad news on Christmas Eve. So I know it's good. It's fine. You, you, were, you were not worried at, at all, all. No operation, just, just at oh, okay. all i even it? took that i took that date as confirmation it was fine <laughs> i was like no <laughs> no um and they'd also said you can bring someone with you to the appointment if you and i was thinking i'm not going to waste anyone's time coming to hear that there's nothing wrong so i didn't bring anyone with me and in typical fashion i go into that like the appointment room they were 20 minutes late to see me which isn't actually normal and i know some people will say oh, the nhs you're always waiting but for these appointments i'd never been kept waiting and i was kept waiting for 20 minutes and i saw loads of people coming in and out of the room and i was like oh they must be really busy today anyway i go in swinging my car keys as i'm always doing because i don't usually carry a bag and um there was four people in that room shopper, four. <laughs> and when I saw those people, I said, this cannot be good news. So I looked at them and I went, there's too many of you in here for this to be good news. And I was like, I'm a joker. So I said it hoping they'd laugh. Nobody laughed, <laughs> literally. They looked at me like this. And one of the women looked like she wanted to cry. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I sat down and they said, you know, You've got breast cancer in both breasts. I literally said, yippa, 
I'm put my hands on my head like this. And um, all I thought of was my daughter. My dad had died two years before that of terminal, um, terminal. He had basically had terminal cancer in his liver, but terminal cancer in his abdomen that had spread to his liver. Mm. And um, that was all my daughter knew of cancer is that cancer killed grandpa. So my heart immediately went to my child is she's going to think that I'm dying and then it went to my mom because as the firstborn, since my dad passed, I'm now viewed as the one that's responsible for my family, which includes my mom, who's not very well, and my younger siblings. And all I was thinking was, God, it's not my time. Like, these guys still need me. There's still work for me to do here. And I still need to raise my child. So I immediately came out of the room and called my auntie, who actually recently passed. And she is, she is even still in heaven, she's my prayer warrior. Like that woman, listen, she can pray away anything as far as I'm concerned. So I called her and I told her the diagnosis and she immediately started praying with me. I were crying and praying. I cried for two days. So I like would sneak off into the bedroom to cry because it was Christmas the next day and I was with my family and my daughter. So I didn't want them to know. My brother and sister knew only because they'd seen my eyes red. <clears throat> and I said, you can't tell mom, can't tell Lara until after Christmas. Um, so I affirmed it for two days, prayed, got prayed up and then just got into, OK, so we just need to get rid of this now. And that's what we did. So um, I had the trifactor of treatment, chemo, surgery, radiotherapy. I had all of it, man. It was exhausting. But through it all, I can honestly say that I was excited because I knew that God was going to get me through it. And I also knew there was a huge blessing coming after it. Wait, 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 wait. Just <laughs> wait a minute. When you talk about you were excited, were you excited at the end of the journey, at the start of the journey, mm -hmm. doing the journey? Mm -hmm. Because I can't even begin to imagine what that was like carry that weight your daughter like i said your mom family all of that that's that's a lot so when did, when did the excitement land and how did you like navigate through that journey so i am always someone who i like to reason but my reason is a godly reason like reasoning so i always like i know everything happens for a reason and i also know that god never gives me more than i can handle so after the first three days of the initial shock, I said, OK, let me ask and speak to God, like, what's really going on here? <laughs> because this is a lot. Right. And I remember speaking to him and looking at my vision board <clears throat> and my vision board for that year, which I had done in early December, had said that in 2021, I wanted to sell my flat and buy a house. I wanted to get a promotion. I wanted to do all these things. And I said, God, I get it. I get it. What you're putting me through now is necessary to take me to the next level. I think I said this to you before. I feel like when we go through the maddest stuff or just feelings and, and it, periods of things not being settled or you're just feeling like unsettled and things are going wrong and whatever... I feel like that happens because we've gotten too comfortable and God's saying it's time to move, like get moving. And I felt like even though it was an extreme way to get me moving, God needed to give me a kick up the bum to move. Um, and that's why I got excited because I was like, I get it now. I get it. And, um, you know, all of my friends that are Christians and that, you know, that that know me well, I just like whenever they've got drama, they know that if they come to me, I'm going to be like, get excited. Something's about to happen. And I genuinely believe it as well. But also when my dad, my dad was diagnosed two, my dad was diagnosed one week before he died. And he, in my mind, gave up. Like he decided once he knew that he wasn't going to fight it. And I genuinely know that when you give things to God, and you trust that he has those things, then you don't need to give up. Like what is giving up? You've given it to God. Like you need to, you need to lean into it because 
we need to do our work here for God to do his work up there as well. Um, so yeah, I got excited. I was like, okay, God, like, let's do it then. And we're, gonna, we're just going to do it. Um, don't get me wrong. It was, it was not easy at all. I don't wish chemo on my worst enemy and I don't have any enemies by God's grace, but, um, yeah, it wasn't pleasant. Um, I will never be the same physically as a result of that treatment, but I'm also grateful for who I am today as a result of what I've gone through, because the, the grace that you see today is able to be vulnerable, is able to ask for help, is comfortable and understands that having limitations doesn't make you weak. And I'm really grateful for that because for a long time in my life, I felt like I had to carry everyone's weight as well as my own. And it was exhausting. Um, and I'm really comfortable with being, I call it baby girl. Like I'm comfortable with being baby girl now, with being soft and being vulnerable and allowing people to help me. It feels really, really good. But one of the experiences that I had during my treatment was I had a consultant who you know, as you do, you're with these guys a lot. So one day she was asking me what I do for work. And I told her and I said, but I don't, I'm not happy with what I'm doing. And I feel like this, this, what I'm going through now is telling me it's time to move. Like I've been sitting still for too long. And she said, oh, I'd be careful. Because once you've had cancer, it's really difficult to get work. <laughs> I said, were you not, were you not I, working? Yeah. No, I was working, okay. but I was, but I, I was telling the consultant, that I feel like I need to move. Like, I feel like part of what, what I'm going through now is, you know, my creator telling me that I've been comfortable for too long. I need to move now. And I feel like, you know, now's the time for me to move. And that's what she said. She was like, you struggle to get a job. And that spoke to my experiences or some of my experiences as a black woman in the UK trying to climb the corporate ladder and not finding it easy, you know, because there's almost in some in some organizations there historically was a view that, you know, you should be grateful to be a manager, like stop being greedy or, you know, relax or whatever. Um, and. And then to now be someone that as a result of my cancer diagnosis and treatment is now considered to be legally disabled and has protection against legal discrimination. Um, I was like, wow, there's just another protected characteristic now that if I were still in the corporate world, I would have to question, am I going to disclose this? Because they can already see I'm black and they can see that I'm a woman, but this is something that potentially they don't need to know about because you don't have to disclose a disability. Um, you know, but then I thought to myself, this isn't something that I should have to worry about. And it isn't something that anyone should have to worry about. Um, which is why I started my consultancy, Equates Consulting, and that's why I do what I do now. It's to support everyone to feel like they can be them, their complete selves in organisations, but also irrespective of their background or their protected characteristics, they can be and achieve anything they want to do in the, in the organisation that they're in. Um, and yeah, I absolutely love what I do. And I think what my journey has allowed me to do is to understand how important it is for me to walk in my purpose and to now walk in my purpose with conviction. So for me, the work that I do is more than a paycheck. It's actually, this is my calling. So that is what really drives and motivates me. But also when we spoke, I think it was last week and you talked about like having a son, you know, and wanting your child to to do essentially what they want to do when they grow up. Like that definitely drives me. Like I've got a little girl looking at me and I want to make sure that when I'm not here, she's in a world that was better than the world that I had. So, yeah. It's powerful. I think it's, for us in the next question, I'm curious. One of the things you shared around a lot of times when you see things play out and you're like, okay, this is here because God's shaking me up to move me forward. Do you think all pain is good pain then? Or how do you know when it is something that you're supposed to utilize to move you forward? And sometimes it's just like, you know what, life does actually suck sometimes. I don't think any pain is good pain necessarily. However, I know that God will get you through it. And so, you know, obviously as a believer, I also 
believe in the devil and I know the devil is real and there are some things that happen in our lives that aren't God ordained they come from the devil but God is what gets us through those things and so I don't I know there are some crazy horrible things that happen to people and that you know that have happened to all of us to some extent and I don't think those things are from God but I know that it's God that's gotten us through them um, and I think that the growth and the blessings are in coming out of those experiences and still trusting and believing and having faith and being able to to live the lives that God has ordained for us. Like, you know, life life was never going to be easy uh, because once Eve ate that apple, we were screwed, right? But it's really about what we do with the lives that we have here and how much faith and trust that we have in, you know, whoever it is that we believe in. I'm listening to you right now. I'm like, Grace, the journey you went through was remarkable. And it's amazing to hear that you were able to find your purpose through that and step into that. But I am struggling right now to be able to go through my journey, which might not necessarily be cancer, but go through my journey, my difficulty, and I've been navigating as as a parent or navigating other other spaces. What would you say that through your experiences that will be able to help someone be encouraged to keep on just pushing forward? I would say don't give up. <clears throat> One of the things that got me through my cancer journey is being able to look back and seeing where where I've come from so I was divorced before my 30th birthday I had a two-year-old child to raise at the time you know I lived in a house that I owned with my husband who paid the mortgage you know I lived a soft life at that time but I was divorced by before I turned 30 I remember my 30th birthday I was crying at my desk like what is my life you know I've ruined my life um I suffered from postnatal depression for two years uh, after my divorce I didn't even know I was going through it before my divorce um, I was in a really dark place and God got me out of that like so that was one example for me and there were other trivial ones like smaller ones before that but that was the biggest kind of life-changing experience that I had that I saw transformation from and then when my dad died I've never experienced grief like that in my life and I don't think I ever will. My mum is still here, but I believe that the chasm, that losing half of the person that made me, um, I don't think there's a chasm deeper than that. But like that loss was the biggest pain I've ever experienced in my life. And I didn't know how I would get out of it, but I trusted God to get me out of it because he'd done it before. And he did, he got me out of it, I'm great, I was great. And then I got cancer and I was like, listen, <laughs> I'm thinking of like, you, there's no point in time you're saying to yourself, like, come on, like, can I catch a break at least? Like, no. it seems to be a recoupling as something is happening and then you're back on top and then you're getting up back down again. So this is stay the faithful is not, it's not easy as well. You've all. heard the saying, I'm sure, of when they say that God gives his biggest battles to his greatest warriors. And I've seen a lot of the videos, like, <laughs> Lord, I don't want to be one of your, <laughs> one of your greatest warriors. I'm done. Absolutely. Listen, when I got diagnosed with cancer, that's how I felt. I was like, I like God, this is a lot. Okay. I know I'm strong, but this is a lot. But I genuinely believe that when you have a calling, which we all do, in order to be prepared for that calling, there are certain things you need to experience to become the person that's able to achieve and live that calling. Um, so what I would say to anyone that is in, you know, their darkest point at the moment or is in a battle or a struggle is look back on what you've experienced so far and look at how you've progressed and how you've gotten through those things because you're still here for a reason and in the same way you've overcome in the past you will overcome again just trust if you believe in God lean on him not your understanding because your understanding will have you lying down in bed every day like the world is over if you lean on God's understanding you move differently right um and that goes for anyone that believes in a higher power when you know that things are bigger than you 
then you're trusting in someone that's bigger than you. So what you're able to achieve, based on what you're able to achieve, then you might think it's KO, you're done. But it's not what you're able to achieve. It's about what your creator is able to achieve. And if you're not a believer, again, just look back at what you have overcome in the past. Like, you are able to do amazing things. Just trust yourself and trust your ability and trust that in the same way you've overcome in the past, you can overcome again. That's what I'd say. One of the lessons that you said you learned was learning to be able to effectively let go and let other people in. Don't feel the need to be able to carry that load and that burden by yourself. I'm curious if you compare your previous you to your new you, you carrying the load by yourself, you'd be responsible for your mom, your siblings, your friends versus letting other people in. What's the difference in your, I'm going to say your joy, your fulfillment, your general living? What's the difference between both? Right, so my joy is extra, extra, I can't even say the word. Exponential. It's exponential, thank you, right? I had a word a lot on your podcast, I couldn't say the word, so I have to say. <laughs> That's true. Um, so basically, like, when I, when I was trying to be everything for everybody else, it meant that people didn't know how to be anything for me. So the relationship was very one-sided. It was very much, I was the one that poured into everyone and I gave to everyone. And what that led to was resentment on my part because I was drained, I was exhausted, I was tired, I was lonely because people weren't checking on me because as, as far as they were concerned, I was fine, which is why I was able to pour into everyone. And I was very good at acting fine because I'd grown up with a mum that did it really well. <laughs> and like she instilled that in us is like, you're fine, okay? And you don't tell people your business and what happens in this house doesn't leave this house. So I very much grew up with that mindset and that doesn't serve you. So for me, the new grace that shares with people that I trust and that allows people to help me is so much happier because I now fill my cup to the point of overflowing. So when I do give to other people, my cup is still full. There isn't anything being taken from me that leads to me being exhausted or leads to me being tired or feeling resentful for those things because I'm filling my cup and that's my responsibility. It's my responsibility to make sure that my cup is filled to overflowing before I give. And I do that every single day. Like I believe in making sure that each and every day you do something that makes you happy, whether that's going to the gym, whether that's having a cake after dinner, whether that's doing your nails, like whatever, whether that's doing your eyebrows in the morning, whatever makes you happy, do it every single day. Cause it's so important. Um, so yeah, that's the difference. Like I, I'm legit happy every single day because I pour into myself and I don't, I don't expect anybody else to do that for me. But also I've, now that I'm able to ask people for help, I've actually developed closer relationships with people because I heard a long time ago that altruism is a, is a myth. There is no such thing as altruistic behavior because we take a feeling of goodness from doing acts that appear altruistic. When we yeah. give money to someone on the street, we feel good about that. So that wasn't altruistic. When we help someone, we feel good about that. So it wasn't altruistic. And what I've learned, particularly with my family, is that now that they're able to help me, they feel a sense of fulfillment because they are now able to do something for me. Um, so... So it's it just feels good all around, essentially. Such a powerful reframe, actually. Recognition that actually, if I say that I love and care other people, me allowing them to show love and care to me and towards me is also important to them. Definitely. Because in that way, it's not one way thing. I love, I love that. I love that way of framing. Actually, that I think is super important. Mm. And as you've navigated your journey steps into your purpose you're also in a space that in a sense is not easy to navigate working with organizations to help them to see the the value of what they should do 
is never easy, especially mm. now in times when it's like, oh, the layoffs happening, there's a recession, depending on what what they actually look at. Oh, we don't really, yeah, we don't really care about DNA. Okay? Like that's also there. There's so much stuff that can be like, do I really want to do this anymore? Mm. How do you keep on going and pursuing that purpose that is full and present and real for you to make a difference and impact in the lives of other people? I think that, you know, one of the things that I hear said a lot and I, I agree with is that my job will be done when there are no barriers for anyone that is non-white yeah. or able-bodied, right? We are not there yet. So I know there's still work for me to do. Um, so even though we do hear, you know, we don't have the budget or we're reducing our budget in this area or, you know, what's happening in the United States with legislation against D D and I, um, what's recently happened with Diana Abbott, et cetera. Like those things are exhausting to hear and to see again and again, but they also highlight the importance of the work that I do. And they also highlight the the need for me to be here to support organizations to better advocate and support their employees who identify as being from diverse backgrounds because each and every one of these things that's happening across the world is impacting individuals within organizations mentally emotionally and in some in some situations is it's actually impacting their progression in organizations the right organizations appreciate that and understand that and want to fix it um so that's what keeps me going is the fact that actually there are organizations that know that they need this support and you know some of them will do it before they need it some of them will do it when it's you know when the ish hits the fan um but the fact of the matter is like i need to be here in this space to support those organizations when they're ready to to tackle those issues why do you then also then ensure that you are protecting your space and the way you just previously described because like i said the down about thin i'm so down about thin the the racist and violent misogynistic comments that are made about that ever there but that's just one example of so many more that come out on a regular basis so how do you actually protect your energy and your space to ensure that you are in the best possible shape to show up and do what you want to do yeah so I talk about this a lot, kind of the connection between inclusion and mental health and well-being. And obviously, if you're someone that, that does this for a living, it can be mentally and emotionally exhausting, especially if you identify as being from a marginalised background. And for me, like I'm really big on self-care and self-love. Like I, I almost book time in for me. So, um, you know, with, with what I what was happening yesterday with all of the press about what Diane Abbott experienced, but the comment that was made and the bigger impact that it's had on black women across the UK, um, me being one of them, like yesterday was a really heavy day for me, I've got to be honest. Like I was mentally and physically exhausted. By two o'clock, I was lying down and I didn't understand why, but it was from that issue and the fact that it's still happening in 2024 so um sometimes you do just need to stop you need to stop and understand that you're feeling something and allow yourself to feel that and to process that feeling and then make space for healing so whether that's praying whether that's reading you know reading the word whether that's going for a walk or going for a workout, doing something that fills you with joy is really important. Like I start every single day with a workout. That's really important for me. But then the day still happens. The stuff can come up. And just making sure that you just take some time, I think is really important. But I do, do also encourage like having a coach or having a mentor that you can speak to about some of the things that you're experiencing in your work, just so you're speaking it out and, and kind of letting it go to a certain extent. And journaling is always good too. Some amazing, amazing tips that people can definitely take on board to help them to self-regulate. Mm. I think that's probably one of the biggest things. If you don't self-regulate, it just 
stays and sips in in you and whether you recognize it or not like subconsciously it's a way at you and Absolutely. it just yeah it turns you into something you don't want to be so Absolutely. Having, having that space for you to pour out reflect exercise write speak to other people very very critical for sure so important i am um, i'm really big on self-regulation i think a, a lot of black women in the uk are big on self-regulation because we have to be like there isn't there isn't an option to be an expressive angry black woman so we learn to self-regulate very very early and i think self-regulation is so important because life keeps on lifing and we get to choose how we respond to that and i always say like just choose to be kind and choose to be good. Like there is no excuse for waking up and deciding to treat people like rubbish or to speak to people disrespectfully. If you feel like you're getting to that point, then you need to self-regulate. You need to take yourself away and speak to yourself and calm yourself down, but also get the issue out in some way. So that's why I believe in writing. Because for me, the power in writing is you're offloading that. Like once that's in the book, it's written you can go back to it when you want to to understand what was happening but you need to offload somehow it's really really important and we've just got the work we're doing is so important like we can't afford to be reckless with this at all it's really important like I I talk a lot about the work that I do I'm passionate about delivering inclusion work with love like I believe that true change happens when people feel safe and comfortable and I don't believe that we need to be angry or confrontational in order to enable change because humans don't respond well to that. We don't. And, you know, I'm really passionate about making sure that I'm always in the, the right mental mental space to do this work effectively. Two more questions before we wrap up. I'm listening to you talk. My mind goes back to you sound like I'm going to say there's a very enlightened grace that's speaking to me right now how do you navigate failure because i also listen to a very hard working successful grace that showed up in in the younger years of who you are but then you've talked about how for you at 13 not being married and being divorced and crying how that that had its impact on you and they navigate those different challenges so mm. how do you navigate failure now 39 years old, a lot more wisdom in your day, in your day to day life. I've accepted that failure is part of life. I feel like we grow from failure. Um, but I've actually got a tattoo that says never a regret, always a lesson. Like I believe that every failure is an opportunity for you to learn and grow. Um, so don't get me wrong. I don't enjoy failures. No one does, but I definitely take them as an opportunity to develop and to do and be better. So I learn from all of my failures and I see them as learning opportunities. Um, and I think that's, that's again, a gift that you give to yourself because we can't just like, why are we sitting in misery because something's not worked? Like that's life. Sometimes things don't work, but how we choose to progress from those is what will then mean, is what will then determine kind of what our lives become and what we do with our lives. So that's how I navigate failure. I see everything, every failure as a lesson. How do you define leadership? Right. So to me, one of my best leaders ever said that his measure of success is the number of people that he recruits that progress beyond him. Yeah. Um, for me, true leadership is seeing your people as people and appreciating that their needs and wants matter and supporting them to achieve those needs and wants. Um, I think sometimes we confuse management with leadership. So managing people to do a particular job, but when you're leading people, you are leading people to achieve goals. Um, some of those will be organizational goals, but a big chunk of those should also be individual goals you know what do your team members want to achieve and what they're capable of achieving and how are you as a leader advocating for them to achieve those things how can people learn more about you work with your organization tap into your content um 
contact me on LinkedIn. I am very active on LinkedIn. It's very Grace Masura. <laughs> Um, or via my website, um, which is www.acquaintsconsulting.co.uk, um, or listen to my podcast, which is available on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, and Google. Um, and it's the Organizational Inclusionist. Grace, thank you very much for sharing your journey. It's, um, I love listening to people go through multiple stages of their life and be able to connect the dots, but also see that change come with the experience. And I think it's something I never take for granted, seeing people actually learn from the experience. Because some people who, they have the same experience over and over and over again, they don't learn from it. Mm. So being able to actually learn from your experience to help you evolve and to become a better person, but also being very much like, you know what, I'm faith is important to me i use it everything in every area of my life even when things are tough and put into that and i'm happy to put that front and center um i think it's, a, it's remarkable and you definitely need a lot more of that so thank you for sharing this, your story my pleasure thank you so much for having me this is everyday leadership we will see you next week Thank you.